Okay, um, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to the Physics and Astronomy Department, if this is not your home. Uh, my name is Marcelo Gleiser, and today I wear the hat of the director of the Institute for Cross-Disciplinary Engagement, which is an initiative that we have here where we try to bring the sciences, the social sciences, and the humanities into what we call constructive dialogue. And the way we do that is we try to focus attention on questions which we consider being like the big questions. And within those big questions, we need sort of uh, complementary points of view that can help one another gain a better understanding of what the story is about. And some of the questions are very grand indeed, like uh, what is the nature of reality, the nature of time, is there free will, and, uh, and on and on. And this is all done as part of the Institute's uh, initiative, which is sponsored by the John Templeton Foundation. I'm going to write down the website for the Institute there because a lot of our events and lectures and interviews are archived as videos. And uh, in particular, um, I wanted to advertise that November 1st, so is that next week, we have a really, really cool event that I hope everybody is going to come, is what we call a public dialogue. And in the public dialogue, in this particular one, uh, we usually do that everywhere around the United States, New York, San Francisco, uh, Chicago, but we're going to do it here in the, at Dartmouth, November 1st at um, 4.30. I'm going to write that down as David is getting settled here. But we're going to have, the, th the theme is on being human. What does it mean to be human? And we have three different people talking about their perspectives on humanity. One being David, who's going to give us a more planetary, astrobiological view of what humanity really means. And then we're going to have a novelist and string theorist, a Pakistani woman called Tasneem Hussein, who is also a fellow here at our institute, who's going to talk to us about humans as storytelling animals. And finally, we have a professor of anthropology, Jerry De Silva, who actually is the kind of guy that goes to South Africa and digs bones of hominids and, and figures out you know, the missing links of our ancestry, who's going to give us an anthropological view of what humanity means. So we're going to have these three people. I just moderate the conversation. And to make things more interesting, we have a dance company that we have specially commissioned to open the evening with a choreography, because after all, humans love dancing, right? So it's going to be that. And then after that, we're going to have a reception. So I hope you all come. Tell your friends. It's going to be at Filene on November 1st at 4.30. But tonight, we have some, well, yeah, almost night anyways. We have something a little different going on. We have David Grinspoon here. He is uh, currently, he is a fellow at the Institute here. So for those of you who are familiar with the Montgomery Fellows, this is sort of a smaller scale uh, operation of, of a Montgomery Fellowship where we invite people that we think are very good at what they do, in particular in bringing the humanities and the sciences together. And I'm really, really happy to have David here with us. He's been, uh, he's been here since, I guess, late September. He stayed until about before uh, Thanksgiving, I guess, so late November. So David is a senior scientist at the Planetary Science Institute in Washington, D.C. He's an adjunct professor of astrophysical and planetary science at the University of Colorado. He's an astrobiologist, award-winning science communicator, and prize-winning author. His newest book is Chasing New Horizons, Inside the Epic First Mission to Pluto, co-authored with Alan Stern. He is a senior scientist, as I mentioned, at the Planetary Institute, and his research focuses on climate evolution on Earth-like planets and potential conditions for life elsewhere in the universe. He's involved with several interplanetary spacecraft missions at, for NASA, the European Space Agency, and the Japanese Space Agency. In 2013, 13, he was appointed as inaugural chair of astrobiology at the U.S. Library of Congress, where he studied the human impact on Earth systems and organized a public symposium on the longevity of human civilization, a topic that obviously is of interest to all of us. His technical papers have been published in Nature, Science, and numer numerous other journals, and he has given invited keynote talks at conferences around the world. 
David's popular writing has appeared in Slate, Scientific America, Natural History, Nautilus, Astronomy, Seed, the Boston Globe, the Los Angeles Times, the New York Times, and Sky and Telescope Magazine, where he's a contributing editor and writes a quasi-monthly cosmic belief column. His book, Earth in Human Hands, was named a best science book of 2016 by NPR Science Friday. In his previous book, Lonely Planets, The Natural Philosophy of Alien Life, which is, by the way, an awesome book, which I highly recommend, Lonely Planets, is really, really good, uh, won the Penn Center U.S. Literary Award for Nonfiction. David has been a recipient of the Carl Sagan Medal for Public Communication of Planetary Science by the American Astronomical Society and has been honored with the title Alpha Geek <laughs> by Wired Magazine. He lectures widely and appears frequently as a science commentator on television, radio, and podcasts, including as a frequent guest on Star, Star Talk Radio and host of the new spin off Star Talk All Stars. He's also a musician. He currently leads the house band of the universe, and, and he lives in Washington, D.C., with his wife and dog. So, actually, the dog is here, right? Coming this week. Coming this weekend. Okay, great. So his talk today is The Emergence of Planetary Intelligence, an astrobiological perspective on the human chapter of Earth history. So let's all welcome David. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot, Marcelo. Um, and um, thank you all for coming out this afternoon. Uh, as uh, Marcelo mentioned a few years ago, Five years ago now, uh, I got this wonderful opportunity to be the chair of astrobiology at the Library of Congress, which was then a, a new position. So I was the inaugural chair. Um, sadly, it was uh, not permanent. It's rotated off. So now there's uh, there been a succession of, uh, of new chairs. I say sadly because it was an incredible experience to be at the Library of Congress working for a year. And um, this is the ad that I saw that sort of catapulted me uh, in this direction uh, for a n this new position. And in particular, they were looking for somebody to undertake um, sustained, uh, where's my thingy, there it is. To undertake sustained research at the intersection between astrobiology and the humanities. Um, and this gave me an excuse to uh, propose uh, this project that I had been fantasizing about, but not sure where I would ever find the, the time and, and resources to work on. And, and so this was the title of the proposal I wrote for that, Astrobiology and the Anthropocene Era, Exploring the Roles of Life and Intelligence on Earth and Elsewhere. Um, and very fortunate for me, I was chosen for that position. And so I launched into this project, which uh, several years later finally became this book, Earth in Human Hands, uh, sort of summing up some of what I worked on there. And this afternoon, I'll share with you a few of the ideas in this book, as well as uh, some things I've been thinking about since that time. So talking about astrobiology, I assume a lot of you know what it is. But uh, given that this is cross-disciplinary, and uh, hopefully um, people uh, have uh, come from far and wide, I won't assume that everybody knows anything. So let me briefly say that astrobiology is the study of life in the universe in which we apply our growing knowledge of life on Earth, its history, its limits, combined with our growing knowledge of uh, how different environments elsewhere in the universe have evolved to map out the potential for life elsewhere and how we might go about finding it. One way to think about astrobiology is its effort to figure out how life and how we fit into the story of cosmic evolution. Cosmic evolution is our story of the universe where we focus on the major sort of transitions, the major chapters of the universe. And, and this is my one page cartoon summary of the entire history of the universe or of cosmic evolution. Obviously, there's a big compression ratio when you fit 13.7 billion years of evolution and complexity onto one cartoon, uh, one page. Nonetheless, uh, the point of cosmic evolution, of thinking of it that way, is that you focus on the major transitions. And so here are some of them. The or, uh, you've heard about the Big Bang, and we have the origin of galaxies. And then within galaxies, you have molecular clouds, which give birth to stars. 
And around stars, you have the formation of planets. And at least on the surfaces of some planets, actually just one that we know about so far, you have uh, an origin of life. And then uh, the evolution of uh, complex life and what we uh, so proudly call civilization. And then in the bottom right there, it ends with question marks and says, what next? Because uh, there's no reason why we should assume that the stage that we find ourselves here on Earth is the, uh, the ultimate, the apotheosis of cosmic evolution. Uh, and one, I'll point out just a couple things quickly. Uh, inside the uh, magnifying glasses there, that's meant to show what's happening on the micro scale. So uh, inside of um, molecular, inside of stars, you have the birth of elements. Stars are element factories. And then inside of uh, molecular clouds, uh, you have the form of simple the formation of simple organic molecules. And then on planets, um, you have the formation of these more complex organic molecules, uh, which uh, give way, at least here, to life. And everything on the left side of this cartoon, these are all processes and transitions that we know to be universal throughout universal throughout the universe. It's redundant. Uh, but we, we know it happened everywhere in the universe, galaxies, stars. And in the upper right, the formation of planets, 15 years ago, if I gave this talk, I would have said, well, this is something that we suspect might be universal, uh, but we haven't found the evidence yet. But of course, now that, wonderfully, this is the good news for modern humanity, that, that uh, wonderfully we've confirmed this suspicion that planets are everywhere. So that now moves from the category of something that we suspected was universal to something we know is universal. Now we know that every star in the sky basically has planets. We didn't know that when you were born. Um, so this is, this is new and, and huge. And in a sense, we could regard astrobiology as the effort to understand whether these next two cartoon frames, the origin of life and the origin of complex life, we want to know, are those also processes which we will be able to put in that category of universal occurring throughout the universe? Just as with planets, when I went to grad school, we were taught that planets, we suspect, are everywhere, but we didn't know. We had, didn't have the evidence. Now, people in grad school are being told the same thing about life. We suspect it may be a universal process based on what we know, but we haven't found the evidence yet. So in a way, astrobiology is the effort to answer that question, whether these final, not necessarily final, but the last two steps uh, indicated here are also universal to, to place us in the story. The local part of our story begins about 4.6 billion years ago with the collapse of one of those molecular clouds to form our star, the sun. And around that sun, a disk of gas and dust we call the solar nebula. And within that, the formation of the planets through a process, process that we call accretion, which is basically the smashing together of smaller bits to make larger bits, pebbles, and then cobbles, and then th finally uh, things we call planetesimals that are up to uh, 1,000 kilometers across, and then the collision, more and more violent collisions as gravity increases between those planetesimals, finally to form uh, the last large object standing were the planets. So that's accretion, and then a lot happened between then and now, and I'm going to fast forward since we only have an hour, but um, on one of those planets, something rather interesting happened. If you were, say, an alien astrobiologist with a long attention span watching Earth for the last four billion years, uh, sort of in time lapse, you would have seen a lot happen on this one planet. You would, have, you would see the uh, continents shifting around like this uh, sort of morphing spherical jigsaw puzzle, coalescing and splitting apart, sliding around the planet. You'd see uh, ice ages come and go and hothouse climates come and go. So you'd have the polar caps growing and shrinking and growing and shrinking, 
quasi-rhythmically. And then about 400 million years ago, you'd see the greening of the continents. Um, but the night side, the dark side of the planet, throughout all that time, would have been a nearly completely unbroken black, unbroken darkness. Uh, occasionally, you'd have the, a few um, splashes of lightning or flash of aurora. And then, starting with the greening of the continents about 400 million years ago, you'd have the occasional forest fire at night. But in general, it would have been just dark. Until very recently, a blink of an eye in this story, you would have seen something very different happen. You'd say, whoa, what is this? All of a sudden, the night side starts to light up in these patterns that, that start in a few coastal areas and then spread across the continents in these sort of quasi-organic patterns, but maybe not entirely organic. Maybe it seems as though there's something else going on. And then right after that, you'd notice a lot of other accelerating and rapid changes on the land surface, the ocean surface. You'd see these um, linear waves start to streak across the ocean. These linear clouds start to streak across the sky, changes in the atmospheric composition. All of these things happening at once, right as the night side lit up. And then very recently, in just the last twitch on this cosmic time scale, about 70 years ago, you would have seen another really strange behavior on this planet. This planet that four and a half billion years ago uh, fell together through accretion. Now you would see little bits of it start to leap back off into space. Uh, the, these little uh, um, insect-like uh, metallic um, structures leaping back off the planet, surrounding the nearby space, and some of them streaking off to the other planets. Now that's a weird thing for a planet to do. <laughs> clearly, clearly to your, your alien astrobiology eyes, something new and strange and unprecedented is happening to this planet. That uh, last little bit of um, strange behavior, the leaping off of, uh, of material back out into the void, I like to call a curious anti-accretion. And I mean curious in two senses. One, it's a weird thing for a planet to do. All of a sudden, start throwing back bits of itself back out into space. But it's also uh, curious. It's, it's a hallmark of the appearance of a certain kind of curiosity on our planet. Techno technologically enabled curiosity is here and is making its presence known, sending little emissaries off to the other worlds, seeking one species here on this planet is uh, seeking answers about uh, our world and its history and our history. And uh, going off to the other planet and sending information back through radio waves. Um, Clearly, there's something new going on here. Well, I have actually made my living more or less through part of this curious anti-accretion doing what we call uh, comparative planetology, using the knowledge we get from exploring other planets to uh, try to understand general uh, theories for how planets uh, form and evolve and uh, illuminate uh, the story of our own Earth through uh, this, this exercise of understanding what we're seeing what we can learn about other planets. And there's a lot that we could talk about that we've learned through this exercise of comparative planetology. But uh, one thing uh, that's relevant to the story I'm going to try to spin this afternoon, uh, the one thing we've learned is that, in particular, these three planets uh, I, I enjoy studying quite a bit, Venus, Earth, and Mars, because Venus and Mars are the two most nearby and two most Earth-like planets we know. And the comparison reveals a lot to us. And one thing we've learned is that these planets all started out with very similar origins and early environments. They've gone in radically different directions in terms of their environments and their climates and their surface and atmospheric processes. But everything we've learned about the early history of Mars and the early history of Venus tells us that both of those planets started out much more Earth-like. And it's been a process of divergence since then. So it may be that what's really rare about Earth 
is not the conditions for the origin of life four billion years ago. In fact, it may be that rocky planets all start off with an environment sort of similar to the way Earth was at the time that life seems to have formed about four billion years ago. And what's rare is not necessarily having had those conditions, but the maintenance, the persistence of habitable conditions, of bio-friendly conditions over billions of years. And one thing some of us are starting to wonder is to what degree the presence of life itself has helped to maintain those conditions on Earth. Some sort of complex feedback that some people call the Gaia hypothesis. At any rate, um, it's been said, a colleague of mine said at a, a meeting a couple years ago, and I wrote it down because I liked the way he said this, that the defining characteristic of Earth is planetary scale life. Earth teaches us that habitability and inhabitants are inseparable. It's not enough to talk about a planet with perfect conditions and then you have life on top of that uh, as an afterthought. The more we learn about the role of life on Earth, the more we realize how pervasive it is and how many of Earth's physical characteristics have been, have been altered, if not determined, by the presence of life. Not just the obvious things like the oxygen in the atmosphere, but even the, the minerals on the surface, the rocks on the surface, two-thirds of the minerals on Earth uh, are either directly or indirectly uh, biogenic minerals caused by the presence of life. And now we're, we've learned that the composition of the ocean, the climate cycles, the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, all of these great geochemical cycles are actually biogeochemical cycles. Life is really bound up in the functioning of Earth. So there was a uh, bifurcation early on where Earth went down a different path than Venus or Mars. And we had an origin of life and then sort of a takeover of Earth, if you will, by life, where life became pervasive, became a quality of the planet. When Earth went down its own path. And more recently, Earth has come under the influence of a new force, a new type of geological activity, the global activities of humanity, which have defined uh, what's been called a new geological epoch, the Anthropocene. And Looking at this in terms of overall planetary history and looking how Earth bifurcated, split off from Venus and Mars with life that became a global scale phenomenon, I wonder if this is possibly something that can be seen as a similar branching point. And it makes me wonder, could intelligence like life become a planetary property? I'll come back to that question. But part of what I tried to do with my work at the Library of Congress and my, my approach to my taking an astrobiology approach to the Anthropocene is ask, um, what is it really that is unique about human influence on Earth? Are we worthy of calling ourselves, you know, naming a geological epoch after ourselves? Or is that just an exercise in uh, ego, self-aggrandizement, or is there really something new happening on the planet now that's worthy of a new geologic name? To get a handle on that, I've looked at uh, other major transitions that have happened on the planet, tried to characterize the current transition on Earth with relation to those. And it's worth pointing out in that context that we are not the first species to come along and radically change the planet. We're not the first species to come along and cause mass extinction of other life. We're not even the first species to do that in pursuit of a new energy source. Pursue, discovering a new energy source, exploiting it to the point where you're polluting the atmosphere and causing extinction of other species, that has been done before. Sorry, we're not that original, um, at least in that regard. Um, in particular, these little guys, the cyanobacteria, they did it two and a half billion years ago. Now, they look innocent enough, don't they? But in fact, they um, discovered a new energy source and polluted the entire atmosphere and drove most of their contemporaries extinct. Now, in their case, that new energy source they discovered was solar energy. These guys perfected photosynthesis. And that gas they polluted the atmosphere with was good old O2, oxygen. Now, of course, we love oxygen. I mean, I know I do. Can't get enough of it. But that's because we've evolved to take advantage 
of that same fact that led it to be so deadly when it first appeared in large abundance on Earth. Oxygen reacts powerfully with organic matter. Energetically, releases a lot of energy. That's why stuff burns. That's why organic stuff burns. So when oxygen first appeared, this poison gas, cells couldn't handle it. Now, of course, uh, evolution is opportunistic. And uh, you know, one man's poison is another man's food, or whatever the expression is. But uh, the, uh, uh, those same powerful reactions, if you could evolve to utilize them and power yourself, that's what life did. That's called respiration. And in each cell of your body, there are uh, little power plants that um, uh, do those reactions where oxygen uh, is combined with organic molecules, releases energy that's stored up, and then you use it. That's how we live. We take advantage of those same reactions. But when oxygen first appeared, life was helpless, and not that life that couldn't sort of uh, hide in these little anoxic uh, in environments uh, died out. So we're not the first to do that, yet there's obviously something new going on here. What have we got that the cyanobacteria didn't? You know, what, what are we doing that's different from that? Uh, and this is another way of phrasing this question of uh, what's sometimes called human exceptionalism, what's really new and different about the human race. And you know, a lot of people have tried to answer this question, and again, we could argue for hours about these things like language, tool use, a lot of things have been pointed out, and then, and then people make these counter examples where they're not unique, tool use, uh, you know, it was, it was man the tool maker, and then Jane Goodall came along and showed that chimpanzees were using tools, and by the way, she also, uh, by her example, demonstrated that man is not a great generic term <laughs> for the human race. So we don't talk about man the tool maker anymore. But at one point, that was it, right? Uh, but you know, art, technology, um, all of these are arguable and controversial. And yet, taken together, we can talk about these human qualities, uh, intelligence, consciousness, foresight, awareness, use of cumulative knowledge, culture, um, uh, a sense of responsibility. And uh, we can, without arguing the details, we can talk about these human qualities and realize that there is a new kind of presence on Earth behaving in new ways and manifesting itself in, uh, in terms of major planetary changes. I, I gave this talk at the SETI Institute and a colleague of mine there, uh, Jeff Moore, um, a uh, clever and cynical friend of mine, pointed out that you could look at these, these, this as uh, uh, this bottom list of all the qualities that we actually don't have enough of. Um, fair point, but at any rate, um, we can look at this set of qualities and look at our situation on Earth now and legitimately ask, are these qualities adaptive? In the long run, will they help us survive or are they some kind of an evolutionary dead end? Or could they be a potential gateway to great longevity? If civilization is now a planetary process, then what are its prospects here and elsewhere in the universe? Is this something we can generalize? Is this, is this a problem that, that uh, life runs into on planets? Is this a kind of gateway that we're facing? Is this something that can be generalized as an evolutionary step that may even have elsewhere? And can that perspective help us get a handle on ourselves? So in order to address this, I've looked at all the different catastrophic changes that have happened, on, not just on Earth, but on other planets that we're aware of, and um, done a sort of taxonomy of catastrophe. And I've concluded that, ca that categorized with respect to the role of life in a planetary catastrophe, there are sort of four major kinds of planetary change. So what I call planetary changes of the first kind are random catastrophes. When your planet just has a really bad day, you know, an asteroid comes and hits it and causes a mass extinction. These are catastrophes where life has nothing to do with it. Life has no implication, just an innocent bystander when bad things happen to good planets. So, um, <laughs> it, it, I mean, the iconic example is an asteroid hitting, but there are other examples, you know, a massive volcanic uh, outpouring because of some burp in the interior uh, dynamics, the interior convection of the planet leads to some huge volcanic episode that causes a mass extinction. Again, just physical um, disasters where, uh, where, you know, these are the kinds of things that will happen to all interesting and complex 
planets in the universe, there will be random catastrophes. But what I call planetary changes of the second kind are biological catastrophes. This is where life very much plays a role. And I already gave the example of photosynthesis, and so I symbolize this with a green leaf here. There are other examples, too, in planetary history, but this is sort of the best one. But it's when the evolution of life itself leads to planetary catastrophe, when some species or some group of species, some, some uh, form of life is so successful at doing whatever they do to survive that they end up changing the environment, the global environment, in a way that uh, is uh, disastrous for other species. So that's planetary changes of the second kind, biological catastrophes. Now what I call inadvertent catastrophes, I'm gonna, call, I'm gonna talk about two more kinds of planetary change, three and four. And importantly for um, the idea I'm developing here, both of these are, uh, are types of change that involve cognitive processes where cognitive processes start to become planetary processes. And yet I think there are, is an important distinction between what I call changes of the third kind and changes of the fourth kind. What I call planetary changes of the third kind are inadvertent catastrophes. This is where one species uh, starts to develop technological capacities. Uh, they uh, have the ability to alter their environment in ways that are much more powerful than uh, one could do without uh, what we call extrasomatic knowledge, and, you know, knowledge that transcends the individual and the ability to manipulate the environment through technology, through culture. Um, but these changes are inadvertent in that these, these uh, clever species, they're clever, they may not be wise, um, but they, they are so good at solving local survival problems with this application of technology that unbeknownst to themselves, they start to cause global changes. And it's part of my thesis that, that uh, on a planet, if you have a species that develops these capacities, that there will always be this phase of inadvertent global change. Because when you're starting out, why should you think, why should you possibly think that you could change the world? It doesn't seem very logically. The world is functionally infinite when you're small in number and local in effect. And then at some point, it ceases to be functionally infinite. And um, that's where we make the transition. But I symbolize this class of change by traffic because that captures one element of it, which is, you see this picture, each of these cars is driven by a creature with agency. We're actually very good at certain things. Driving, there's a lot we take for granted, but you're avoiding obstacles, you're steering, you have uh, agency that it works really well. But then you look at the entire system and you can ask, who is driving the global transportation system? And the answer is really nobody. It's something that we're partici we participate in, but we, we're not really in control of. And we have that sense about a lot of things on the global scale, that we see ourselves uh, partaking, participating in these activities, but we don't really have a sense of agency over them. And that's what I call uh, the Anthropocene dilemma. When your, uh, the scope of your influence exceeds the scope of your control or your agency. It's inherently unstable. On a cognitive, on the level of cognitive development, it's like a, a child who uh, we say does, has not yet developed situational awareness. So they may be a danger to themselves or others. You know, it, it, picture a, a kid with a big backpack on uh, walking into a shop full of delicate stuff and sort of going, oh, look at that, and turning around and <laughs> because they're not aware of the scope of their influence. It's inherently unstable. Um, and that is what I mean by the Anthropocene dilemma, when, when the scope of your influence exceeds the scope of your, uh, your agency. Now, um, some obvious examples of planetary changes of the third kind and inadvertent changes you all uh, know about the Keeling curve. I'm not going to belabor this because you know about it, but we're uh, obviously through our uh, industrial activities, we're pumping up the, ox the, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. You can see this great um, visualization here of sources and sinks of carbon, sources mostly in the industrial areas, sinks and um, some of the large forests. And over here on the right is just one of many familiar examples of um, some of the dangerous consequences of this, the um, frightening disappearance of the 
the sea ice. So this is an obvious example of inadvertent planetary catastrophe. Uh, we certainly had no idea when we started um, burning fossil fuels that anything like this was going to happen. Um, another example of inadvertent change is the famous um, ozone hole, which uh, you've heard about and uh, we discovered in the 1970s. We were uh, destroying ozone with these uh, chemicals, with these uh, chlorofluorocarbons we were putting into the atmosphere. Um, and then uh, it started getting worse, and you can see the, in particular the hole around the, uh, the uh, um, Antarctic um, regions uh, is deepening. But then, if you look in the 90s, uh, it starts to stabilize and even decrease a little bit. Because what happened was, in this case, the scientists, uh, some scientists saw this was happening. They sounded the alarm. There was a big global uh, debate about this, in some ways mirroring the current debate. Uh, if you can call it that, about fossil fuels, where uh, there were people that said it was a hoax, people that had economic interest in perpetuating the status quo said that it was a hoax. Um, there was uh, a lot of um, effort to muddy the waters. But uh, what ultimately happened was it became obvious even to um, the executives at the DuPont Corporation, who were manufacturing a lot of these CFCs, it became obvious that this really was a problem. And uh, global agreements were made. There was uh, something called the Montreal Protocol for the uh, regulation of um, ozone-destroying substances. Um, and um, it's a, the story is more complex than that. But just to move along, uh, the it, it's it's an example of uh, perceiving a planetary emergency and successfully acting on a global scale to mitigate that planetary emergency. And the ozone hole is on its way to being fixed. It's not fixed. We have to stay on task for another half century or so. But, um, and, and there's some wrinkles. But for the most part, the solution is working. So I use this in, as an example of planetary change of the third kind. But I also use it as my first example of planetary change of the fourth kind, intentional global change, which is uh, just what it sounds like. A, uh, um, a global effort um, to consciously respond to a global problem with, uh, with some kind of coordinated action. Um, and there are other examples. This is probably the best and most clear cut. There are examples from, uh, from public health. Um, there's some horrible diseases that have basically been wiped out through coordinated global action. And there are plenty of examples of the need for this kind of change that have not been implemented or are somewhere on the path from realization to implementation. Um, a few things that I would put in this category. I mentioned the ozone layer. And the most obvious need now is, uh, where's my, oh, there it is. Uh, <coughs> most obvious need now is to deal with changing our global energy supply to supply energy uh, in ways that do not destroy the natural systems that we and our fellow travelers on this planet depend upon to survive. Um, you know, the good news is that that change is underway, and there are a lot of signs of that. The bad news, of course, is that uh, the response to that realization is way too slow. And, uh, it's, become very clear that it's not going to happen without some damage. Um, I believe it is going to happen. I believe that 100 years from now, we will be completely post-fossil fuels. And we'll look back and think, boy, that was really stupid that we took so long to do that, because look at the damage we've done. So, uh, But this is certainly an example of a, a place where um, an effort is underway and uh, sorely needed for what I call planetary change of the fourth kind. There are other examples. Looking farther into the future, we can see dangers to not just our civilization, but to our biosphere that will manifest on different time scales. Some of them are much farther in the future. But it is my contention that now that we've started to see ourselves as a geological process, which we are, that we have to learn to think on longer time scales, that one of our 
handicaps in dealing with our situation on this planet is our limited ability to think on longer time scales, on multi-generational time scales. And as we look farther into the future, we can see other threats that eventually will require this fourth kind of global change, intentional. I speak of things such as um, the asteroid threat, Earth has been hit in the past, will be hit again. But uh, that's easily avoidable if someone is on the case. One way to look at the Anthropocene, one hopeful way, is it could be the transition between the time when uh, Earth's biosphere was repeatedly threatened by insults from beyond the planet to the time when it need not be ever again. And if you look at it that way, you could even see the potential ultimately for human agency to save many more species than uh, we are currently threatening because we could avoid the next mass extinction and the one after that. Um, on an even longer time scale, there's the threat of dangerous climate change, dangerous so-called natural climate change. We live under this illusion that uh, left to itself, the planet is this benign garden of Eden and the climate will always be fine if we just leave it alone. But of course, that's an illusion born of the fact that we've grown up, so to speak, in this 10,000 year period of relatively stable and warm climate that is an aberration in the history of the planet. And if you wait long enough, there'll be another ice age and one after that. And there's no way our civilization or most of the species we um, share this planet with would survive that. So uh, our more immediate challenge is to uh, cease the climate vandalism that we are currently undertaking. But once we do that, and we've gained control over our influence on the planet, then we look up and we say, what next? And we go, oh, okay, what are we gonna do about the fact that now that we know how to control our influence on the climate, and what are we gonna do about these climate changes in the future that are not gonna be so benign? Then we have a choice. If, and one um, way to think about this is if we can see these threats coming and have some possibility and I, would, I don't even think it would be that hard to avert them, then that gives us a responsibility to think about how we would do so. So this is looking farther into the future, but I see this is all a continuum of moving from inadvertent to intentional engagement with the planetary system. Oh, and this is just a, a little bit of a reiteration, but this is data. These are all Earth-crossing asteroids. Those are all objects we know about that could at some point in the future hit the Earth. Now this is vastly sped up, so don't freak out. <laughs> don't lose sleep tonight over this. If you want to lose sleep tonight, I can tell you some other things you should think about or just pick up today's New York Times. But, um, th but in the long run, if we're going to think of ourselves as, um, as uh, residents of this planet with agency, which I think we have to think about, uh, think of ourselves as, then this is the kind of thing that we will ultimately have to deal with. And I think we know how to. Um, and I, I already mentioned ice ages, so uh, thinking on longer time scales. So um, I'm going to back up a little bit here to talk about the Anthropocene. There's been some interesting debate over when it started. Uh, and I don't want to belabor that, because I think a more interesting question is where it's going. But just to uh, quickly reiterate, some people think it might maybe started uh, with the invention of the steam engine, and we started really pumping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Some people favor the moment of the first nuclear tests for its um, horrible metaphoric potency as well as the, as well as the fact that it left a uh, indelible layer of um, isotopes um, where that layer can be found for quite some time into the future. Um, so that makes a good geologic marker. And there's some other ideas uh, 7,000 years ago when we started large scale um, agriculture and changing the land and actually really first started changing the climate about 7,000 years ago with human activity. Um, but uh, an idea that I've favored, uh, and, and I've written about this, is that maybe the best strata, if you're looking for what they call a golden spike, a strata that signifies the change of a geological epoch, is this, uh, the golden spike of tranquility base. Uh, because this is a uh, geologic signature that could not have been made by any other species, a species without these qualities we have. It will last for a long time. And it's also symbolic of the moment when we first were able to look back and see our planet 
and reflect on it and us and our presence here in a new way that I think is still rippling into our consciousness and affecting, and I think affecting in a positive way, our ability to deal with this profound new reality that we are planet changers and have to learn how to be better planet changers. I don't think we have the option to stop being planet changers completely, but I think we, there are uh, different paths we can go down where we are, uh, that, that, are, that we can be more responsible planet changers. That's really our choice. Some would like us to completely step back. I don't think we have that choice, but I think we, we can uh, be, be more cognizant planet changers. Um, at any rate, so uh, a different way of expressing when it started. In a sense, it begins with the end of our innocence. Because I think that this moment where we go from what I call planetary change to the third kind, the fourth kind, the fourth kind, where we realize that we are planet changers and then incorporate that knowledge into the way we interact with the planet, to me, that's the crucial moment. Uh, the Anthropocene may have started earlier, but this is what I call um, the mature Anthropocene, and maybe before that was the proto-Anthropocene, when we were changing the planet without realizing it. When we realize it and then strive to incorporate that realization into our global activities, that's a new phase. The feedback between awareness and our global actions, the self-aware global change, that's a completely new phenomenon on the planet. The uh, cyanobacteria never got to that point. Um, and if you look at the Anthropocene that way, then it's just getting started, and then maybe it's something to aspire to. So um, a more interesting question in a way than when it started is, when will it end, or will it end? Or what is it in planetary history? Is it just an event, a little layer in the, in the uh, you know, will there at some time in the future be this little layer of manhole covers and Twinkie wrappers and um, discarded laptops that uh, is all that's left of our ones having been here? Or is it something more long-lasting, an epoch, it, which is what it's been proposed as officially in the geologic uh, time scale? Or could it be something more profound, a planetary transition, like the origin of life or the Cambrian explosion, the major transitions that have only happened a few times in the history of the planet? Um, this is something that I'm really intrigued by, and I'm going to speak a little bit more of that. As another way of asking, is human style in, uh, intelligence adaptive or self-limiting? If it's really adaptive, then maybe it'll be more than just a layer. Um, but as, uh, as Sarah Connor said in the movie Terminator, <laughs> she carved it into the picnic table. She said, there is no fate but what we make. The future is unwritten, right? Um, I know you know the reference. <laughs> or if not, you should go watch that movie tonight. But anyways, we do have some agency here, I think. Um, this leads to thoughts of, of, of SETI. When we think of the far future, at least I think of SETI, because SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, since it started as a field with actually some theory behind it in the 1960s, the practitioners of SETI have always um, realized when you do the math of SETI, you realize that it's all about longevity. The question of is there anybody to talk to, yes or no, comes down to ultimately do civilizations last a long time. If, if it's impossible to live with advanced technology, with planet changing technology, and all civilizations uh, do themselves in after a few centuries, then the math shows there's going to be nobody to talk to. There may be other civilizations, but they'll be so far away that limited by the speed of light, we'll never know about each other or be able to communicate. If, on the other hand, civilizations can last for very long periods of time, hundreds of thousands, millions, even tens of millions of years with some continuity, then the math says there should be probably a lot more of them. Obviously, there's other factors in the equation, but, but longevity is what it always comes down to. So um, thoughts of longevity of our civilization lead me to thoughts of SETI. And, um, it's also just interesting as an exercise, as I mentioned before, to think of this transition happening on Earth now where life has become cognitive and technological and then that is leading to a new mode of, uh, of planetary history. Is that something that does happen, has happened, can happen elsewhere? Um, and even thinking of it that way perhaps can help us 
grapple with our reality here because we, it abstracts the problem a little bit, not to the particular problems our uh, culture and our civilization is facing, but the general problem is of is it possible for a species with world changing technology to evolve this sort of mature, sustainable, long term relationship where uh, you become, your activities become integrated within the cyclic activity of that planet and you're sort of working with the planet rather than against it. As a generalized problem, it's an interesting problem and obviously it's a, one that we um, ought to uh, be, be working on solving very hard. So um, this is from a slide I gave at a, at a, at a study workshop um, actually two weeks ago suggesting that we think about what's happening now is not just a new epoch but a new eon, which I call the Sapiozoic Eon. Um, from the perspective of SETI, maybe it would be fruitful to think of technological intelligence as not just the appearance of a certain kind of civilization on a planet, but a transition in planetary evolution to an eon in which cognitive processes can become integrated into the functioning of a planet. Um, when I say that, what do I mean? Well, an epoch, the, anth the Anthropocene has been proposed as, as um, an epoch Epochs are these little, actually in terms of planetary history, they're just fluctuations. We've been in the Holocene and now it's proposed that we're in the Anthropocene. I've broken it up into proto and mature Anthropocene, but you get the idea. These are just, you know, they're not that important in the history of the planet. They're, they last for a few million years. But on the other end of this chart, and I think you've seen this chart before, the eons, these are the major demarcations of time. There have only been four so far that are recognized. And each of these is a major transition in the planet and a major transition in the relationship between life and the functioning of the planet. So the Hadean was, um, was hell, Hades. Uh, it was all asteroid impacts and volcanism and there was no stable surface for life to exist. The Archean, that boundary, the Hadean to the Archean four billion years ago, that's more or less the origin of life. And then sometime around the transition between the Archean and the Proterozoic, two and a half billion years ago, that's when life took over the planet chemically. That was the rise of oxygen. And uh, if uh, we don't know exactly, um, and I've been in some fun discussions about this, when Gaia was born, that is the system in which life um, has sort of taken over the planet as opposed to just the moment of the origin of life. But certainly by the Proterozoic, with the rise of oxygen, life had taken over the planet chemically. The uh, Phanerozoic is when life got big and complex, plants and animals took over. And my contention is that you could look at what's happening now, not just as a new epoch, but as a new eon, in the sense that cognitive processes becoming planetary processes, that's potentially a huge transition. It's potentially, I think, as important as the origin of life or what, these other major transitions. If it sticks, it's only an eon if it sticks. And of course, we won't know that for millions and millions of years. So in, it's sort of an aspirational title. The name is also aspirational because Sapiozoic means uh, time of wisdom, right? So, but I also, I separated from the Anthropocene because I, that way it's not necessarily humans. Someone else could do this on another planet or on this planet. It's, it's a name for a type of transition that a planet could undergo. And if we play our cards right, maybe the Anthropocene could be the beginning of a sapiozoic eon on Earth. Or maybe not, but it's a, it's a way of sort of separating out those con concepts. If it's going to be an eon, it requires that these cognitive processes become a long-term stable part of the planetary system. When that implies a very different behavioral mode than is currently being exhibited by so-called intelligent life. You know, from a systems perspective, the early stages of this uh, are highly unstable because global, as I mentioned, global influence precedes global control. And therefore, you're going to get positive feedbacks of the kind we're getting now. Conscious awareness and control can be sources of stabilizing negative feedback. I think we have examples of that. Uh, whether or not that mode can take over enough to lead to a sustainable civilization, I mean, that's really the question that we face. This is another way of, of, uh, of describing the dilemma of modern humans. Now, people have talked about this 21st century bottleneck. Some really smart people, Martin Rees and E.O. Wilson, have described the convergence of technological acceleration in all these areas, not just climate change, but um, cyber um, warfare and um, potentially dangerous uh, nanotechnology, environmental poisoning, all of these things 
um, are accelerating in a way that uh, is obviously threatening. Martin Rees, in a book he wrote in the 1990s, gave us a 50-50 chance of surviving the 21st century. I think he has a brand new book where he's a little more optimistic, but I haven't read it yet. I think I need to, fast. <laughs> um, but, uh, but at any rate, Several people have talked about this bottleneck. It's a bottleneck because it's not clear we can get through it, but there's a potential endpoint where these, if we harness our ability to use these technologies and our ability to, uh, in some sense, have some global control over ourselves, then one can see how a lot of these technologies could become a gateway towards great longevity. You know, if we don't have to worry about that next asteroid impact or that next ice age, in a way, we've got a leg up on the dinosaurs and other species, we could potentially, you can see a possible future in which we could use our skills to have great longevity. But first, we have to get through this bottleneck. Oh, and if all that wasn't enough, we have to worry about the zombie apocalypse. Um, the, um, so this idea of a bottleneck leads to the idea in SETI of a bifurcation in lifetime of civilizations. Um, in other words, it may be that a lot of species don't make it through the bottleneck, and there's some finite lifetime. But then there may be a, ga a gateway, even if it's a very thin one, towards great longevity, essentially immortality. And if you, if you factor that in, I'm not going to show you a slide here. I pulled it out with a lot of math. But there's some interesting quantitative uh, implications of this. But the punchline, one punchline is for SETI is that what we seek is not what we are. That it's not enough to build a radio telescope, which is a little bit of a joke because uh, there's this joke, and it's only sort of a joke, that if you ask a SETI scientist what the hallmark of intelligence is for a, um, another species in the universe, they'll say the ability to build a radio telescope. But of course, all these guys are radio astronomers. Um, but it, the thing is, we can build a radio telescope, but can we, do we have a civilization that can broadcast or listen for centuries? Well, not yet. But if nobody does, then there's going to be nobody out there on the airwaves. So longevity is more important. Um, so I'm going to skip a little bit here because I want to get to the end. And I'm running a little bit long. But the punchline here is this idea of planetary intelligence, that rather that, that this is actually a way we can think of, a different way of defining intelligence on a planetary scale, getting through the bottleneck to a state where technology and society are able to facilitate long-term survival, where technological civilization is well integrated into the cyclic activities of a planet, may, that may be the important transition more than just building a radio telescope. Um, I saw this tweet a couple years ago. Somebody said, the world is failing badly at its climate goals. And then they were actually making an important point. But what I wrote to myself in a little note was, what does it mean for a planet to have goals? You know, we, we use this kind of language all the time. But it's also kind of um, a puzzle. It seems as though the essential problem is struggling to achieve some kind of global intentionality. Um, we have qualities we associate with intelligence on an individual level, right? If you can perceive information in your environment and act on that information and behave in certain ways um, to avoid danger or to facilitate your own survival and propagation, that's a kind of functional definition of intelligence. I'm saying it in a crude way, but you know what I mean. But those qualities um, on an individual level are necessary but not sufficient for global survival. So is it useful to think of defining intelligence as a global property? Um, and something I've been thinking about recently, um, and this is, I'm just throwing out there something I'm thinking about uh, and doing some reading and trying to decide if it's um, worth writing about, is the question of have we been constructing some kind of um, global brain, if you will, um, although I don't like that phrase, <laughs> some kind of cognitive structure of which we may be unaware. If you look at um, all our um, global networks of trade, transport, governance, et cetera, the things I've listed here, do they in some ways function as um, some, some kind of uh, cognition? And when, when you say that, it seems absurd. But it seems a little bit less absurd when you think about how a brain works. And I've been doing some reading. Um, and one thing you conclude is that nobody knows how brains work. But one good idea was expressed in this book that I read many years ago and found influential. And I think it's still considered a good idea. Uh, Marvin Minsky, The Society of Mind, um, where he 
talks about mind being constructed of a lot of agents which are of themselves not intelligent or conscious, but interact in ways that are. And I thought, well, could we turn this around and talk about the mind of society? Um, in the introduction to Society of Mind, Marvin Minsky says, asks, how can mind emerge from non-intelligence? Minds are built from mindless stuff, from parts that are much smaller and simpler than anything we'd consider smart. So given that, um, and looking at the world and all these networks we've created, and the fact that the planet on some level is obviously starting to perceive itself as in uh, some danger and starting to, in a sort of slow, dumb, but apparently uh, with rudimentary intelligence way, starting to act on those dangers, uh, is there in fact some sort of global cognition going on that we may not even be fully aware of? It's just uh, it's something that I'm wrestling with a little bit. So um, to wrap up, well, here's, a, here's something that expresses this a little bit. I'll just read you this quote from, from my book, Earth in Human Hands. Um, I talk about all the satellites we have up there that are now self-monitoring and creating this new view of ourselves. It says, if Earth has been evolving a diffuse new organ, a sky-high mycelium of floating mechanical sensors growing far above its surface, keeping a continuous eye on itself, uh, we've shrouded our world with all these satellites. We're monitoring our planet, spotting previously hidden patterns, and constantly firing instantaneous signals around the globe like cells in a restless planetary superbrain. With these compound orbital eyes and self-assembling cyborg mind, we perceive with new depth and acuity that we are deeply embedded in complex global systems and cycles of matter, energy, and information. Augmented by these senses and memories, our cave-evolved intellect, supersized with supercomputers, is just now attaining vast new abilities to comprehend the non-local present and model and anticipate the future. So um, is this something that uh, can help us to think of ourselves this way? And is it, are these abilities we can foster and do a, a better job of managing ourselves? It's clear to me that in order for our civilization to survive, we do need to become a new kind of entity on this planet and learn to live comfortably over the long haul with world-changing technology. This vision, and I developed this more in my book, but I call it Terra Sapiens, which means wise Earth. It's not necessarily something I think we can achieve, but it's something I think we need. It's essential we have a vision of where we're going in the long term. It's not enough to just be aware of things we want to avoid on the short term. We have to have some, somewhere we're aiming towards, and that's what I call Terra Sapiens. And when people say that it's uh, impossible because of you know, human nature, I like to remind them of, uh, some stories from our, the history of our, our, our species. Our species has constantly, continuously, repeatedly reinvented itself when faced with existential threats. There's a site at the southern tip of Africa called Pinnacle Point, which some archaeologists think is the origin of modern humans, anatomically modern humans. About 190,000 years ago, there was a genetic bottleneck. Um, we've learned this from studying our our comparative genomes, that, that uh, the human race almost went completely extinct. We were down to probably fewer than 1,000 individuals at that time. Because of climate change, it was an ice age, and we couldn't be hunter-gatherers in the way we had been because there was no range for the game. Uh, a small band of our ancestors repeated, uh, retreated to this place, Pinnacle Point, and learned to live off the ocean, S shellfish and other um, new sources of food. And part of the way they did this was by inventing new technologies and new forms of communication, new forms of language. This is the first place where we see evidence for what's called um, complex recipe long chain technology, which basically means some really complex thing where uh, you're creating something where the uh, products are not obvious from the ingredients, like heat treating rocks. There's a complex recipe, and you need complex language to uh, pass it on to the next generation. So we survived by reinventing ourselves and in widening our circle of cooperation with our contemporaries and with future generations. We've done this before, and in a way, I think that's our challenge now. We need a kind of reinvention and need to see ourselves on a new scale. And when people tell me, ah, Terra Sapiens, that's impossible, one thing I like to ask them is, could you imagine trying to describe a modern city to the people of Pinnacle Point? the way we live now, it'd be really hard. Maybe that's as hard as it is for us to imagine the world of Terra Sapiens, the world that we're, our uh, descendants will ultimately need to create, to live sustainably. But it's also worth pointing out that when we first made cities, we first lived in cities, they were awful places. 
They were horrible. They were public health nightmares. And we had to invent the right technology to live well in that density. Crucially, we had to invent sewage systems, a wonderful technology that we don't even think about because when they're functioning well, we don't have to. They run silently beneath the streets. But before we had sewage systems, we threw our crap into the streets. And um, you know, cholera and uh, you know, cities were awful. Um, so in a sense, now our challenge is to invent the sewage systems of the 21st century and um, figure out what to do with our atmospheric effluents. And, and, and um, it's going to be some, some combination of restraint, realizing our uh, environmental restraints, and, um, and innovation by which we're going to uh, get out of this mess, I think. Uh, I'm going to skip this. I had a point about metaphors we used to describe ourselves. We can come back to it, but I uh, used up enough time. So finally, I just want to end with this quote by Martin Luther King, who said that in order to have peace on Earth, and I interpret this also as uh, in order to build a sustainable global society, our loyalties must transcend our differences. And this means we must uh, develop a world perspective. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Okay, that was, uh, that was wonderful, troubling and inspiring, I guess. So I invite people to ask questions. We have a few minutes for that. Yeah, uh, that's, that's a great question. Um, in, case, in case you didn't hear, it was about thinking about longevity and thinking about globular clusters, places where stars are close together. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's a slide I, d I didn't show, but if you're interested, I could um, find it and show it to you, where I, where I put the, the different problems on different time scales. So uh, global warming, we have to solve you know, this century, uh, even sooner. And then there are, you know, asteroids we have to really deal with at least, you know, in the next few thousand years if we, you know, don't want to get, try to be too lucky. And then uh, um, ice ages we have to deal with certainly in the next 50,000 to 100,000 years. And you keep going, and on my logarithmic scale, by the time you get out a billion years, assuming anyone's here, um, we're going to be in big trouble because of the evolution of, of the sun and the fact that there will be inevitable um, runaway greenhouse on Earth, if, if nobody does anything, the Earth will become uninhabitable just by the evolution of the sun on that time scale. So then what do you do? You know, and it's like, maybe that seems very science fictional. It does, but if we're thinking in these terms, then you know, that's just another problem to be solved. And what you do is either you do some massive geoengineering at that point, or you move. And that's where I think your question comes in, because yeah, there are um, civilizations uh, in certain locations in the galaxy will have a lot more options. Um, if they choose to do that. And you mentioned globular clusters. Yeah, places where there are lots of nearby stars. You could, you know, assuming at, if, if we've somehow made it that long or our descendants have or our machine descendants or their descendants <laughs> have lasted that long, then uh, I think they will uh, probably have the means to, um, to move. And um, yeah, if you lived in a globular cluster, which is a place in the galaxy where there are a lot of stars close together, for those of you that don't know, then then you'd have more options. Is that the kind of thing you were getting at? Yeah. Cool. All right, any more? Yeah. yeah so you were saying when you were kind of making this taxonomy of catastrophes, you're thinking like a competitive plant ecology perspective of that. And I'm wondering why, when you set this up, you didn't do non-random abiotic processes, which seem to be the one that could cause major catastrophes, and the other two out of the three terrestrial plants, which you really have something to do with understanding. Well, um, I mean, th I, that's my uh, category one. Well, are those random? Would you call roadway greenhouse effect on Venus random? Ah, I see what you're saying. Um, yeah, um, that's a good point. So there, there will be some locations uh, in in the uh, uh, in the galaxy, some planets where um, the odds are stacked against you, um, and there will be. That's an interesting question. Would you call that random? I mean, there are places where you wouldn't choose to take up residence because uh, you know, the, uh, on a planet like Venus, the habitable days are numbered, yeah. right? 
Um, so yeah, you could, you could break down that taxonomy if you wanted to. Um, I would probably, well, yeah, that's an interesting question. You, you might just sort of leave those planets out, places where uh, habitability was obviously going to be limited by some other factor. But you could also add in another uh, um, class of uh, catastrophe for predictable um, planetary changes like that, which on some time scale will happen to all planets. So yeah, I think that, that's a fair point. Good. One last question, if there is one. Anyone? All right. Oh, one more. Yeah. Um, if, um, you, as you were describing earlier on, the, the idea of life development on planets is the universe, how like, how like, in what way is it likely that we would find that evidence? Yeah. Well, first of all, I don't claim that it is universal. So if it was but, but I claim that um, that's a driving question and that we have not gathered the evidence yet to rule that out. Um, but what's exciting, of course, about the current time is that we are uh, rapidly gathering evidence. We've recently discovered the exoplanets. We are um, characterizing the early history of Mars. We've got a mission um, that's going to be launching to Europa. Um, so we're um, at least to some degree on the trail of that question. So as far as uh, your question is how we would discover that. So. Um, there are a few obvious ways that, that we could. Um, one is that there are a few places in our solar system we haven't explored well enough where they seem like they could certainly, I mean, Mars to me is probably not currently habitable, even though some people think it might be underground. But I think Mars is an excellent place to look for fossils because it had a very Earth-like environment apparently early on when life got started here. So it could have gotten started and then died out. As far as currently extant life, it's worth looking in these buried lakes on Mars, um, but I'd be more inclined to say in our solar system that uh, some of the oceans of the outer solar system are, are more promising because they not only have liquid water, but they have energy flows and organics and nutrients and the kind of environments we've come to understand seem promising. But a whole other avenue is the fact that now that we've discovered the exoplanets, uh, we know that all the stars have planets, but we don't know anything about those planets or barely anything. But we're now uh, conceiving and starting to build the next generation of space telescopes, which will allow us to start taking detailed spectra of their atmospheres. And if it's the case that there are other planets out there with atmospheres as flagrantly perturbed by life as Earth is, then we should start to see those uh, in the next 20, 30 years. So um, on that time scale, we won't necessarily, I can't promise you we'll know um, for sure the answer to that big question of whether life is to some degree universal or common or not totally rare. But I think we will know the answer to uh, the question, the more limited question, are there many planets with atmospheres as flagrantly perturbed from equilibrium by life as Earth's is? And the answer may be yes, in which case, if it is, then I think we will discover life in the next few decades, which would be uh, pretty cool, wouldn't it? <laughs> On that note, thank you very much, David.